zone! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're re-watching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing True Confessions, released September 25th, 1981. It was written by John Gregory Dunn and Joan Didion, based on the novel by Dunn and uncredited work from Gary S. Hall, directed by Ulu Grossbard, or Grossbard, and released by United Artists. On January 9th of 1947, aspiring actress Elizabeth Short was dropped off at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown LA by her boyfriend to meet with her visiting sister before a road trip to San Diego. The hotel staff that day were the last on record to see her alive. Nearly a week later, on the 15th, her body was discovered cut in two pieces at the waist in a vacant lot in Limert Park. Unfortunately, she was discovered by a woman on a walk with her three-year-old daughter. Short's mouth had been sliced open at the edges into what is known as a Glasgow smile, but which always reminds me of Takeshi Miike's Ichi the Killer. The remains were slashed all over with a blade and intentionally posed. Reporters were on the scene very quickly and snapped several photos of the body. William Randolph Hearst's Los Angeles Examiner was characteristically shitty, reaching out to the victim's mother for an exclusive interview by claiming her daughter had recently won a beauty contest and then punctuating the conversation by admitting she had been heinously murdered. Wait, her mother didn't know? Correct. They reached out to the mother immediately upon the body's discovery before the police could get to her. What? And lied that she had won a beauty contest so they could talk to her about her daughter for a while. Oh before admitting to her the truth. This is why they don't release names of victims before uh, yes. before family has been notified. Jesus Christ. By way of half-assed apology, they offered to fly the woman out to L.A. to assist in the investigation, but instead kept her away from police and guarded her for her entire visit from other reporters looking for the same scoop. The same paper, The Examiner, made up all the more lascivious details of the case to sell headlines, even coining the nickname Black Dahlia, suggesting without evidence that Short was a, quote, adventurous who, quote, prowled Hollywood Boulevard. Another week after the discovery, Examiner editor James Richardson received a call from the purported killer congratulating him on the successful coverage and promising a delivery of souvenirs belonging to the victim. Sure enough, Three days later, a collection of Short's personal effects were delivered to the examiner, scrubbed free of fingerprints with gasoline just as the body had been, leading the police to suspect the caller was in fact responsible for the killing. This is all really fascinating. Uh, it would have made a good movie. Yeah. I, I'd like to watch this movie, please. <laughs> well. I mean, I know there was a Black Dahlia yeah, movie. There wait, is wait, a wait, Black Dahlia movie. Wait, when, <laughs> when does the church get involved? Wait for it. Why do, why do they pick? They the, don't. Why do they pick the least interesting perspective of this story to make a movie out of? I'm not sure. <laughs> a couple months later, a suicide note was discovered in a pile of clothes in Venice Beach, claiming responsibility for the murder and suggesting that guilt drove them to suicide in the absence of progress in the investigation. It read, "To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not." I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that or this. Sorry, Mary. An address book among the supposed suicide victim's effects led police to a wealthy nightclub owner named Mark Hansen, who it turned out was alive and later cleared of any wrongdoing. Over the course of the investigation, hundreds of suspects were considered, but none has ever been confirmed. Various crime authors and law enforcement have proposed a connection to the 1936 Cleveland torso murders, wherein several people's torsos were presumably murdered. <laughs> with with the rest of them. No, just no. their torsos. Just a couple of arms and legs yeah. with a head walking around. Around 1980, a likely torso murder suspect emerged named Jack Anderson Wilson, and he was on the verge of being brought in for the Black Dahlia killing when he suddenly died in a fire in February of 1982. Short's death inspired the formation of California's sex offender registry, the first of its kind in the U.S. 
In 1977, author John Gregory Dunn's novel, True Confessions, was published and tells the story of a fictional Black Dahlia-esque murder dubbed The Virgin Tramp. The rights to Dunn's story were snatched up by Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff. Do you guys recall our most recent Winkler-Chartoff production? Uh, no. They're the guys who fired Monty Hellman and replaced him with Michael Winner, directing The Mechanic for our last Patreon poll winner. Dunn was brought on to adapt his novel into a screenplay and enlisted his wife Joan Didion to rewrite his draft. Robert De Niro based his portrayal of Monsignor Desmond Spellacy on Monsignor Benjamin Hawks, the outgoing at the time Archdiocese of Los Angeles, who had served since the 1950s. De Niro was only allotted a couple weeks between the production of Raging Bull and this film, with which to shed the excess weight he'd acquired for that role. Was that all? When he was like fat at the end there? Right. That was all natural? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Robert Duvall prepared for his part as Detective Tom Spellacy by joining LAPD homicide detectives on stakeouts, observing interrogation practices, and even visiting a real-life murder scene. Director Grossbard had initially envisioned De Niro for the detective brother, and the only other actor considered for a lead role was Gene Hackman, who turned it down, though he couldn't determine which part he'd been offered. Hackman is a close friend and former roommate of Duvall's, so it's possible he recommended Duvall as a replacement. Yeah, I kind of thought that De Niro should have been the cop brother. It right. Was, yeah. It feels yeah. like a weird miscasting to me. The movie was presumed to lead both actors to nominations, and the year before they were nominated for Best Actor against each other as the titular Raging Bull and the titular Great Santini. They had obviously both appeared in Godfather Part Two as Don Vito Corleone and Consigliere Tom Hagen, though never together as they occupied separate timelines the way that film unfolds. True Confessions was intended as an award season 1980 release, but was held back to avoid conflicting with De Niro's nomination for Raging Bull, and reset for February and eventually September of 81. Real-life murder victim Elizabeth Short's story has been told by many authors, but perhaps most famously by James Elroy's 1987 novel entitled simply The Black Dahlia, which was adapted by Brian De Palma into the 2006 film of the same name. I watched it yesterday, and it's a mess. No thank you. Oh, is it really? Yeah, it's really bad. It. We open the film with Robert Duvall as Detective Sergeant Tom Spellacy, made up to look like an older man. He drives an old car down a desert road to a rundown church on the edge of town in Palm Springs, California. It looked too familiar not to be. Yeah. So I looked it up, and it is the same church where the bride's wedding is all shot up and Kill Bill on oh, Avenue okay. G and 198th Street in Lancaster. I thought it looked familiar. We almost had our wedding there. <laughs> <laughs> I looked into it, but uh, it was difficult to book and the interior doesn't look the same mm. anymore. He tells a man outside he's looking for his brother Monsignor Spellacy and the man comments on the Monsignor's health and then excitedly shares his plans to improve the church. Monsignor Spellacy, or Des, as we'll come to know him, steps out of the church, played by Robert De Niro, also aged up. The brothers move inside, and Tom asks about the health problems. Des dodges the question at first, but eventually answers. I'm going to die, Tommy. You're not kidding. God raised to the pump was shot. The camera slowly pushes out the window toward the cactuses in the yard, and we dissolve to the interior of a church decades earlier, with Des officiating a wedding at the altar. Charles Durning as Jack Amsterdam, father of the bride, coughs uncontrollably in the front row and clasps a rag tightly over his mouth. On a city street, Detective Sergeant Tom Spellacy pulls his car to the side of the road just as it overheats. He joins his partner, Detective Crotty, played by Kenneth McMillan across the street, and laments the sorry state of his vehicle. Not, not before opening up his hood and going to take his radiator cap off. You yeah. never open a radiator that's hot. That will, like scald you with yeah. water in the face yeah it, it there's so much pressure built up i don't know if you can see my note <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> you don't do that that's what i was yelling at the tv too yeah <laughs> see well i don't do it because i just keep driving until my car explodes <laughs> i know even less than this guy these two men are lapd and they've been called together to a whorehouse for an emergency and seem to know the women here well one of them offers tom a game of carnival i don't know that one I sit on your face and you stand against my weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> this is like one of two chuckles yeah. that I got in this movie. The detectives are led down the hall to a dead man in one of their rooms. Evidently, he had a heart attack while sampling the merchandise here, and Crotty recognizes the man as Father Mickey 
from St. Bernadette's in Redondo Beach. Tom guesses correctly that the girl he was with stole some extra cash from the body and scares her into returning it, but then gives her a couple bills back to reward her honesty. Well, I think it was the five dollars that she was she owed. Was owed oh, for okay. services. I thought I thought he gave her some back because he was just like, okay. No, you, I think I think it was uh, her, her actual her payment. actual payment. Crotty is already amused by what the Monsignor will think of all this. We cut back to the wedding reception where the Monsignor speaks with the father of the bride. Mr. Amsterdam wonders what the Cardinal thought of the ceremony, and Des apologizes on the aged man's behalf for having to leave early. Mr. Amsterdam is very splashy with his money. He spent four thousand dollars. $49,400 in today's money, on roses for the ceremony, vintage French champagne for the reception, and he's even sharing surefire tips for the Santa Anita racetrack. We cut back to the whorehouse and the bedroom of the Madame Brenda, and she and Tom clearly have a history. She's still sore about a time that she was made a scapegoat for some past crime and sent to prison. She seems to know Tom's whole family. And your brother, the Monsignor? Okay. I used to listen to him on the radio when I was in the joint. Religious hour. I'll bet he said a novena for you every time that you and I screwed. She asks if Tommy ever told Des that he worked as a bagman for Jack Amsterdam. She makes a suggestion that the reason she got jail time and Tom didn't is because of his connection to Jack through Des. Apparently, Jack owns and operates this whorehouse, and Tom accepted payments on behalf of Vice to leave that place be. Anything else? Yeah, just get that stuff out of here. Once a bag man, always a bag man. That's a really great line. Yeah, he half-assedly apologizes for slapping her. Back at the reception, Dez's acquaintance, Dan Campion, who I couldn't get a read on. Is this guy, he works with Jack the, Amsterdam? I, I think he works with the church. I think he's, he's like a person between them? Yeah, I, I, th I think he's there, like, the church probably doesn't employ this type of service of a of a crooked lawyer so he's like a contractor for amsterdam yeah uh he's played by ed flanders and he shares with des a plan of jacks to donate a school to the church to be built by his own construction company of course but des sees through the scheme and happens to know that amsterdam needs the work and the church's land and he's trying to make a favor for himself look like a favor to them the bride thanks des for offering the church to their ceremonies and for officiating he confirms that he knows why they're getting married, implying an out-of-wedlock pregnancy, but Des urges her not to worry about it. I, okay, so like that that tidbit of information you had there, that he needs this for his own purposes. Right. Rather than just purely for the benefit of the church. Mm -hmm. I, how did you get that out of this movie? <laughs> because he says to Campion that he knows that he doesn't have any lots to work with. He, he has... A lot of people that he keeps employed, he needs to be building stuff all the time, and he doesn't have a lot right now that he can build on because the church owns so much land in the city. Okay. And so he says that, he, basically he lets on that, I know you need this more than, than we do, but I'll still talk to the cardinal about it and potentially but get this I don't. I don't underway. quite understand how it makes sense if Jack pays to just keep his own people working. Jack's not paying for it. Oh, I thought he was no, donating he, to get this to happen. No, he's. it's not going to be a free school. It's going to be a school below what other people would have charged him for it. But it's still going to cost money that okay. the church will be paying him. But he doesn't have anywhere else that he can be working right now. He, okay. he needs the work. So essentially, the gift that he's giving the church is just a discounted rate. A huge rate. discount on a school. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I gotcha. I'm following you. I could not, <laughs> could not figure this movie out. It took me a while to figure out who Dan Campion was to any of these people. Yeah. Who Jack is, like even what Jack's job is, because we take so long to get into the nitty gritty with these people. But it, it took me back and forth across a lot of these scenes to figure out what's happening. I watched it one and a half times and I'm still not clear on yeah. it. How did you get the the pregnancy part 
because oh, she that... says, you know why we're getting married, right? And he says, yes, but you're doing the right thing. And earlier, okay. earlier, the Jack made a terrible comment that she looked like a stuffed sausage in her dress. Oh, a okay. donut or a something. A donut. Yeah. yeah, that was it. And then, the, then they said like off-white was yeah, the yeah, color yeah. of the right. dress. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought that it was just like a forced arranged marriage. No. Uh, and so like I was like, I don't understand. I mean, but, it might be being forced, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, At this but, point yeah. it would be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but now I see now I see what. That yeah. makes more sense to me. Back out on the dance floor, Amsterdam does some fancy toe tapping, which is funny because back in our review of The Fury, he claimed he couldn't dance a step, but he looks pretty competent here. I like his little leprechaun moves. <laughs> leprechaun moves <laughs> we cut to tom wandering around dez's office and reading the paperwork on his desk about amsterdam's construction deal when dez shows up he invites his brother on the next trip to visit ma but tom isn't interested well, last time i saw she talked to me about uh, purgatory and how much time i was going to spend there life plus 99 years you still eating cereal with her fingers well, you know, she, she still thinks that the early martyrs didn't have spoons in the catacombs. But tell her they didn't have instant cream of weed either. <laughs> this is the last funny moment. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the movie is is just yeah. sad. Well, th- there is one other funny moment, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about <laughs> okay. it when we get there. Tom points to photos of Des in Amsterdam and asks if it's true that Des put in a good word to get the man a visit to the Pope, and he says he did. Tom shares with his brother how dangerous Amsterdam can be by telling the story of a business rival who was thrown in a dryer for competing with him. Des asks for proof, and Tom points out that he doesn't ask for proof of God, so Des shouldn't need proof of a crime. Which means that I should believe you. No, meaning you want to fall into shit and think it's clover, then don't believe me. Which is weird because I would say that there is no proof that you could prove that God mm. exists. So there is no proof that you could prove that Jack's a bad man. That's what he should have said. <laughs> do you remember the last time we had a body in a dryer? Oh, I do. Oh, is that my a... bloody Valentine? <laughs> That's right. And then before that, do you remember? There's another one. Out in the cold. What? We didn't cover MacGyver anything. episode. Oh. Where he throws one of the henchmen in the dryer after he knocks him out. And then presumably the man is killed later. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever go back to get that guy out of the dryer? Oh, Ooh, whoops. <laughs> yes. Tom takes this moment to share the news of Father Mickey dying in the whorehouse and Des appreciates his brother's discretion. We cut to the scene of a grisly murder, which reminds me a lot of the first crime scene from a game called L.A. Noir. And actually Tom Spellacy here looks a lot like the protagonist of that game, who is also an LAPD detective in mm-hmm. the same time period. I think it's also based partially on the Black Dahlia yeah, case. Yeah. The victim of this particular crime has been cut in half, but Crotty tries to lighten the mood with a joke. I think the butler did it. Don't you ever get tired of saying that? <laughs> See the other half. Yeah. They direct the crime scene photographers to get a good shot of the rose tattoo on the victim's butt. There's another nice touch. They found a candle stuck up a joy trail. Do you guys recall the last time we heard about a woman with a candle stuck up her joy trail? What? <laughs> Um, shoot, I vaguely do. Uh... The guy took pictures of it, and then he showed them to people, and they were like, oh, this one's weird. Ma- uh, maniac? No. No. That didn't have a, a dude, serial killer, that yeah. did have a dude taking pictures, though, too, didn't it? He had mannequins. Oh. Wearing human scalps. <laughs> God. Uh... I, I, I'm not going to get it. Don't answer the phone. Oh, you know what? I think I was thinking of that one and mixing it up I with think you Maniac. Were. They're very similar. Because I, I was picturing the, the desk and the wall with the photographs yep. pinned up. And, he's showing it to the, the fat yeah. guy from Porky's, and yeah. he's like, here's the pictures I took. And he's like, I like this one with the candles. Yeah. What the hell is this? The kid would talk the candles stuck in a mouth and upper pants. That's a little kinky, isn't it? Not for publication. Private stock. Hey. Let me have another look. It might be okay. I might be able to use it. No! A reporter named Howard Turkle shows up, played by Dan Hedaya, to survey the scene and make some bizarre predictions right away. Looks like a werewolf got that. Or a vampire, huh? Well, that's an angle, Howard. <laughs> what, what, what is conducive of a vampire or werewolf attack in this, situa- in this situation? It's like... What? Just the fact that she's in two pieces makes but, him think that it must be supernatural in some way. Yeah, but but neither is like 
typical werewolf thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, she I doesn't can, look eaten to me. Yeah, exactly, and and certainly not vampiric. I activity. understand that part more because no they blood? say she was drained of blood before oh, she was okay. brought here. Yeah. Do you guys recall the last time someone suspected the killer of being a vampire? <laughs> this is now the fourth time in like the last year, I think. Um. God, what was that movie? We just watched one. One that I just mentioned a minute ago. Don't answer. The Mechanic? That. No, the mechanic. with Charles Durning <laughs> claiming he couldn't dance. Oh, no. Everyone's going to know I don't listen to you when we record. Oh, no. <laughs> That's why I do this. Because I, I can picture the scene. Like, he's like, was it a vampire? Maybe. Like, is No, this is, before, this is since then. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no. It had to do with needing to stay away from someone because if you were bleeding it would be a problem if you girls are on your monthlies oh uh, the fury the fury what is this kid a vampire and then before that was the one you're thinking of yeah well, they're, they're talking to the doctor and it's like and he's right. like he's like, he's like is, this, is this a vampire maybe he like, yeah, it could like, be <laughs> it's like what night of the lepus so what have we got here vampires Possibly. Uh, and then before that... Oh, God, I don't remember any of them. A reporter at a crime scene goes up to the police first thing and says, A vampire ape. That's what it was, right, Sheriff? Well, a vampire ape. That's what it was, wasn't it, Sheriff? <laughs> that's from Zat. A vampire ape? <laughs> that's his guess. <laughs> I mean, it's the same as what Dan Hedaya is doing here. In, in the 40s, people had imaginations. <laughs> Shouldn't be the police officers. Though. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's thinking outside the box. Yeah, a little too far. An EMT arrives to collect the body, and he's arguing with the medical examiner who wants him to use two stretchers, one for each half. My best guess is that this is a precaution in case the two halves don't go together and might somehow contaminate each other. The detectives side with the medical examiner. I suppose she was in 14 pieces? You'd want me to get 14 stretches. That's exactly what I'm telling you, asshole. Hey, hey who are you right, calling? Hold on. Hold on. Do as he says, two stretches, okay? I hope this broad leaks all over the goddamn grass. I mean, to be fair, if there were 14 pieces, I feel like they're less likely potentially to go together. Right, but you're also definitely not going to fit 14 stretchers in this ambulance. No, but... You have to it, make six trips. You know, I mean, when you have only two puzzle pieces, you're like, yeah, I can, I can kind of see these two go together. But, like, yeah. you got 14, you're like, I'm not as sure. Too much. Tom puts in a call to the desk sergeant and asks them to check if there are any similar murders on file, and they act like that will take a long time to figure out. That'll take a while, sergeant. What do you mean it'll take a while? She was cut in two. You think it's an epidemic like the flu? We cut to another church event with a mariachi band and a whole courtyard of dancers. I think this is to celebrate the agreement to offer church land for the construction of a school. The cardinal is embarrassed by the show and to be involved in a deal with Mr. Amsterdam. On their way back to the church, he asks Des how many more contracts they have with Amsterdam, eager to sever ties. In recent years, he's done $22 million worth of work for the church, but it only cost them $17 million in an effort to win some good PR locally. Des seems a step ahead of the cardinal here, suggesting it may be time to phase out their association with the man. We cut to Tom and Crotty having lunch at a Chinese food place, and the proprietor offers Crotty a newspaper with an envelope of protection money inside. He tells Tom he used to bust this place all the time, presumably for health code violations, but now he eats here every day because he gets his money back. I probably wouldn't eat at a place if I knew that they had health code violations. Yeah. Is he busting them for health? Like I don't know. They don't things? specify a crime. They just say, here's some money, don't arrest us. And it's like, is there prostitution going on in the back of this Chinese food restaurant? I mean, I kind of assumed there was some other illicit thing happening. Yeah, because uh, later, like, some fancier businessmen right. come out and they tip their hat to him. Yeah, I assume like, those oh, are okay. just the guys who own this and a few other Chinese restaurants in town. But who knows? Tom asks what Crotty thinks about the girl they found in installments, and he says that she's not important enough a victim to give it extra thought. He suggests someone will confess randomly down the line, which they kind of did in the real case. Right. I feel like this movie did a bad job of telling me how bizarre and interesting this murder was. I think it did an accurate job, though, because I think that the examiner tried to make it a big salacious tale. Okay. Yeah. And what really happened was the police were like, oh, yeah, a girl got cut in half. Hmm. <laughs> and never figured out who did it. Yeah, I guess. But I, it just... this. Uh, the murder seems like such a backstory here almost. Yeah, that's true. 
We cut to the morgue where a coroner plays a game with a cadaver's heart. He guesses the weight to impress Tom. What do you think? Well, about 300 grams. Oh, I missed oh, it. Oh, you fired. That's the fourth one in three days you missed. I can't win it. He crosses the room to the rose tattoo victim, now back in one piece. James Hong is playing the attending coroner, actively recording a report into a hanging microphone, but holding up a hand to block the recording to occasionally respond to the detectives. It, I don't know if this is weird, if it, this is weird to say, but um, one, this is James Hong yeah. playing, the, playing the coroner. And, and it's not, there's no jokes or things about him being Asian. Yeah, like, which is like, the first time for him, probably. Yeah, th- this is th- he's being cast as a character, not because of his race, right? Just as a character, and and I was like, oh man, they're gonna make some kind of joke about him or or something like well, that. Well, what's interesting too is that there are three Chinese American men working in this morgue, also. Mm-hmm. So maybe that was just a historically accurate thing mm. that, that that it happened to be staffed that way. But but it was like I was like oh this is great like it's he's he's just playing a character it's nothing to do with him being Asian yeah but he way. does say something about how he found egg rolls in her stomach or something like that yeah but that was just that that's just a autopsy yeah to me but I I didn't they make a joke about it or something and he says no I I had it tested it oh. it, it was an egg roll or something like that I I can't remember what mm. they said was it was Arthur Mallet eating egg rolls in the MacGyver he might episode have been, yeah. <laughs> he had like a little dim sum going on yeah. Later, we see Dez visiting the Cardinal during a game of croquet as he speaks to another Monsignor, Seamus, played by Burgess Meredith. Seamus has nothing nice to say about Dez and is mostly upset about being ousted as chairman of the church's building fund to make room for Dez and his quasi-partnership with Jack Amsterdam. They blame his age for the decision. A man of your years. I'm a year younger than you are, Your Eminence. Oh, you are, are you? Detective Spellis Eve visits a fancy restaurant and tells a snooty maitre d' that he's here to see his brother. I was under the impression that Monsignor Spellis Eve would be lunching with Mr. Amsterdam. Oh, you made a mistake, fuckhead. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is led to a table in the dining room near Amsterdam's, and shortly after, Des is led past Amsterdam's table for a quick chat on the way to Tom's table. Des notices the newspaper Tom brought with him, and his face is above the fold on the front page in connection with the woman found in halves, dubbed the Virgin Tramp by reporters, for being both a prostitute and Catholic. Tom points out that Des is something of a celebrity too, and asks what his pope name will be. Des suggests stealing his own brother's name. There's never been a Pope Thomas. Thomas the First. Thomas the First, I like that. It's nice and calm. <laughs> Constant reminder to me that the flesh is weak. Amsterdam visits their table and insists on paying the bill. He asks for an update on the new school at Rancho Rosa, and Des promises an update soon. Amsterdam tells Tom that Des is a winner. And only the winner goes to dinner. <laughs> yeah, I like that. You hear that, Monsignor? Only the winner goes to dinner. Runs in the family, brains. Really? <laughs> that took brains to come up with? I tried to find if this was a reference to something, and all I could find was a Matt's Ronander song from the early 90s with this exact line as its title, and the song is truly awful. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a clip. <laughs> Only the wind that goes to dinner. Only the wind that goes to dinner. Tom takes this opportunity to throw a wrench into Amsterdam's plans by admitting to have worked with him before. Oh, yeah? When was that? When you were running whores, I was your bagman in Wilshire Vice. I did the payoffs for Brenda. I'm sure you remember Brenda. The color drains from Amsterdam's face, and Des gets the point that Tom has proven what he said about the man. At the same time, it's possible Tom is admitting this behavior to his brother for the first time. Before leaving, Amsterdam tells Des his brother might be crazy, <laughs> and presumably retracts his uh, offer to pay for their lunch, I would yeah. guess. Back at Homicide, Tom takes a call from a woman advising him to place an egg in the victim's hand, close her casket, and wait a week for the killer to magically confess, which is something they did in Gouin, Alabama or something. Mm. Which which maybe they did because uh, they, they got the confession. Oh, yeah, right? seven days later. That night, Tom listens to his brother's religion hour on the radio, unclear if this is his regular routine or if Brenda inspired it by mentioning it. Well, the radio program... Uh, 
like because you just they keep saying hail marys over and over again i was like oh they're doing the rosary yeah (laughs) i was like i recognize this (laughs) yeah We cut to Dez's church where his brother appears to make a confession and essentially apologizes for his disruption of their conversation with Amsterdam. The other day I uh, embarrassed my brother in public. For the using all the sins of my past life, I'm hardly sorry. For your penance, say ten Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers and make an act of contrition. Then they mumble gibberish over each other for a while, which is a traditional church game. It's Latin. <laughs> Back at the police station, Tom and Crotty are screening a pornographic film in a dark room, and apparently the girl in the film is the victim. They recognize another performer as the prostitute that was with Father Mickey when he had his heart attack. Tom heads back to the whorehouse to see Brenda, and they're currently dealing with an argumentative customer, but he gives up his point quick when a detective walks in. Your hat, coat. Come on, just go. Out. Hey, out. Make a good bouncer. Thanks. Tom asks about the girl they saw in the porno, and Brenda says that she fired her already, but happens to know the filmmaker responsible, Leland K. Standard. He casts her girls often, but Lois Fazenda, the virgin tramp, never worked here. Just as the detectives arrive at Standard's offices the next day, they hear a woman screaming. They have to bust into the locked office, and Tom chases a suspect out onto the roof of the building. So when we heard the screaming, I thought for sure that this was like an Another audition. Porn? Yeah. Yeah, like this was like some audition that they were gonna bust in and it was gonna be real embarrassing. Yeah. It was like, oh no, this is like an actual assault is happening. Yep. But totally pointless in the entire movie. Yes. Doesn't make any difference. Correct. I mean a little bit because they get some information here. But they were coming to get information anyways. Right, yeah. I think they just had to make it a more interesting scene than them walking in and talking to a secretary. (laughs) Failed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Tom chases the suspect out onto the roof of the building. When the man jumps across an alley, Tom gives up the chase and returns to the screaming woman. Turns out the runner was a loan shark that Standard owed money to, not the man himself. The secretary here claims that Standard actually died a week ago, and Crotty verifies it on the phone. We cut back to another church where Monsignor Spellacy is giving his confession to Monsignor Fargo, Seamus, the Burgess Meredith character. Father Fargo reminds Spellacy that it's not all about money, but Spellacy asks how they can keep the church solvent without being money-minded. Later we see Des and Campion, this sort of go-between for Jack Amsterdam, golfing together, when Des admits that the church will have to sever its ties with Jack Amsterdam. Campion tries to talk him out of it. It's been going on too long. It's a full-time job looking the other way. He's got to go, and that's it. I don't think you want to get on the wrong side of him. Campion threatens Des with Amsterdam's wrath. It could also cause problems for Rancho Rosa, but Des says he's backing out of the Rancho Rosa plans altogether. The men he's golfing with turn on him now, and Des doesn't budge in his decision. The next day, the brothers Spellacy pay a visit to their mother. She seems a little confused and treats them both as if they're young children, making Tom spell out Immaculate Conception to test his literacy. But also weirdly saying that uh, her child became a nun instead of a priest. Mm -hmm. Like, getting their genders confused. Are those different? (laughs) Yes. Okay. As they drive away from their mother's rest home, they try to make plans to hang out, but Des has too many golf commitments to make it to anything. Tom drops him back off at the church. Des hears the tail end of a chat between Seamus and the Cardinal, and after Father Fargo leaves, the Cardinal announces they will be sending Seamus away. Des speaks in defense of Seamus and points out he's a truly good man, but the Cardinal wants more Deses, men who will raise money and follow orders. The Cardinal also surprises Des with the announcement that he's recommended him for a bishop's position that has recently opened up, and he will soon be able to move diagonally, which is pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so here's why I feel like I was so confused for most of the movie. Because all of this middle section is about, like, how good Des is at, at making them Wheeling money. and dealing, yeah. yeah. But but really, all he is doing, as far as I know, is paying out money at a discounted rate to get the same thing. But the fact that he knew that Amsterdam wanted to build this church specifically because he needed the lot... And he knew that he wasn't getting as good a deal as he claimed. Like, he's he's aware of these things. He's savvy. And okay. he knows when people are trying to screw the church out of money. And he knows what things are worth. Which I don't think 
the Burgess Meredith character wouldn't have known that and sure. and wouldn't have even made the deal to get the church okay. or to get the school out of it. But I guess like it's just the way they make it sound. It's like he's getting the church a bunch of money, like he's getting a bunch of donations to the church. But it's like that's not nothing in this film points to him gaining them money. Well, he he's gaining favors from the church, like things like the meeting of the pope. Amsterdam is this that yeah, is to yeah. say. Uh, you know, he, he's getting, he's getting something out of this deal and he looks, and I think also like the, we mentioned earlier, the PR stuff, like, oh, he's like a friend of the church and, and, you know, we should support his businesses right. because. And he keeps doing fundraisers and stuff for them. Okay. But the, the Cardinal is obviously bothered by their relationship with Amsterdam, but not so much that he's like, cease any and all activity. Sure. But that's what Seamus is saying. Seamus is saying, we should not have ever started working with this guy. He's bad news. And the church should be willing to go bankrupt before they start cooperating with this guy. The Cardinal advises Des to find another ambitious Monsignor like himself to take his own place once Rome approves the recommendation. Des has to tell Seamus what's up and recommends a specific church, but Seamus has his eyes on St. Mary's out in the desert where we started the film. We cut to Union Station, do you guys recall the last time we saw Union Station surrounded by cars from the early half of the 1900s? Um, was it uh, Over the Rainbow? Close. Ah. Under the Rainbow. That's what he said. He said no, Over said the Rainbow. Over the Rainbow. Oh. <laughs> say, say Under the Rainbow. Under the Rainbow? That's right. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I heard. I just heard Under oh, the Rainbow. Okay. No, he said Over. Okay. Which is the song from the movie in the movie. A hearse pulls into a nearby parking lot and unloads a coffin containing the virgin tramp, presumably. The hearse is followed by a cab carrying the victim's parents. It looks like the coffin will be traveling by train, and Tom waits in Union Station with the parents. Tom waits. (laughs) (laughs) The press are swarming an actress named June, who is stepping off the train. Was that uh, June Haver or June Havoc? I don't know. (sighs) I always get them mixed up. Do you guys recall the last time we talked about June Havoc on the podcast? Nope. She played Steve Gutenberg's mom in Can't Stop the Music. (laughs) Okay. The parents talk about their daughter's desire to write and act. They share some of her poetry, and Tom notices a phone number scribbled in the margins of a small poetry pamphlet. He asks if he can borrow it briefly as a handwriting sample. When Tom checks the number later, it appears to belong to a Mr. Jack Amsterdam. That's no good. Tom reaches back out to Brenda, who, confronted with Tom's evidence, admits that the victim was one of her girls, and Jack was screwing her, but to the best of her knowledge, he had nothing to do with her murder. Brenda advises Tom not to pursue this lead because Amsterdam is dying of cancer anyway, which is why we've seen him coughing in every scene, and he's also crazy and unpredictable. Brenda mentions that she's leaving town for a while because she had to perform an emergency abortion that nearly killed one of her girls. She's only telling Tom because it feels good to have someone to say goodbye to. We cut to the presentation of the Catholic Layman of the Year Award, and this year's recipient is none other than Jack Amsterdam. Uh, so this is where I got like my only other like little huh, from this movie, and that's the the uh, anecdote that Robert De Niro was telling in his Irish accent. Yeah, but talking about it, it was like it was like why are you digging a hole? It's like I'm not digging a hole. I'm digging the dirt. I'm leaving a hole. Ah. I was like, <laughs> okay, that's funny. Tom is in the audience and seems annoyed that his brother's going along with this ceremony. Crotty sits with Tom and informs him that Jack Amsterdam can't be the killer because he was in the hospital when she died. After the ceremony, Jack asks Des how things are looking for Rancho Rosa, and Des is still leaning towards stopping down on all plans. Tom has had a few drinks and wanders up to join the chat. He grabs the sash that was just wrapped around Jack with his award and then whips it into the air. What I wonder is if you were wearing this when you were banging uh, Louis Resenda. No, I just got that. (laughs) Amsterdam's face is instantly red with anger. His hands leap for Tom's throat, and a crowd of men have to fight them apart. Supposedly, director Grodbard didn't tell any extras that this fight would break out on set, so the background reactions are all real, when they're like, oh, Jesus, (laughs) these people don't like each other all of a sudden. It obviously causes a huge scene for Jack, and again, Des seems furious to be put in this position between them. Sometime later, Mr. Campion comes to visit Des at the church. He reminds Des that they actually met the Virgin Tramp together a ways back, when she was alive. They picked her up hitchhiking. Both parts? Both halves of her. Campion tries to take the blame for being involved with the girl, and basically asks Des to pressure his brother to drop it. 
Campion also has an alibi for the night of the murder, so he denies any wrongdoing, and finally threatens to take the Monsignor down with him if he doesn't just drop it. Just remember something, Monsignor. You were there the day we met her. Yes, we met her. You fucked her. We cut to a diner, and it seems Des has at least relayed Campion's threats, but he doesn't beg Tom to let off Amsterdam. Instead, he confesses a distaste for this whole job and wishes for a meaningful change in his life. A police car rolls up to the jail and dumps all of Brenda's girls in the parking lot. Tom interrogates them one at a time. When Tom checks the time of death on the filmmaker Standard and the Virgin Tramp, he and Crotty realize that the man probably killed her, dumped the body 12 hours later, and died in a car accident on the way home. Tom drives out to the warehouse on a private road where the porns were apparently shot and explores the building. Eventually, he finds a bloody crime scene confirming his suspicion that the filmmaker was in fact the killer. First, he finds a puddle of blood, and then bloody footprints that lead to a bathroom caked in blood, where we hear echoes on the soundtrack of a woman screaming. He moves to a business office and finds Lois's purse, photos of the girl nude, and a note from Jack Amsterdam which reads, Standard, she's a nice kid, a great piece of ass, and she'll stay out of your hair. And he has inexplicably signed it Jack on his own office letterhead, <laughs> essentially begging Standard to blackmail him with this letter. Tom loses his temper back at the police station, kicking filing cabinets and swatting at desk chairs. He answers a ringing phone and promises to be down to the morgue right away. Evidently, there was an explosion, and Tom is led into a room full of bodies and asked to identify one. Predictably, it's Brenda. Uh, I, I don't think there was an explosion. Uh, Crotty says that there was enough gas to cause, to an, cause explosion, an explosion. But I think, okay. I think that, that it was just a gas leak or maybe a murder we yeah. don't know well when well, we see the body it doesn't look exploded yeah, so, yeah. or a suicide because she yeah. maybe she just turned the gas mm -hmm. on potentially yeah one of the girls said the last person she called was jack amsterdam i don't know what she wanted but i'd say she didn't get it man this amsterdam guy is shit at covering his tracks yeah crotty is convinced that brenda's death was a suicide and amsterdam had no direct hand in fazenda's murder but Tom wants to arrest him for it anyway, for the bad PR, and to force Jack to defend his name in court. We cut to Des waiting in the confessional when Amsterdam shows up to confess. First, he coughs through the window for a while. He doesn't actually confess, he's just here to strong-arm Des into the Rancho Rosa deal. Jack confesses to adultery and fighting with guys, but after the confession, Jack reminds Des how much he's done for the church and orders him to set his brother straight. But Des just nonchalantly closes the window on the threat. Spirit of Santi, I'm in. Go in peace. Open that screen. Open it up! You keep him off my fucking back. He's trying to drop that whore on me. Now, I can't help it if he was on the take, your brother. Nobody twisted his arm. Jack reminds Des that they know he'd met the dead girl, and they'll share that with the papers to soil the names of both Spellacy brothers. Who absolves you? Huh? Who absolves you? I got a family. There's a scholarship named after me. I met the Pope, for Christ's sakes. You understand, you hypocrite? So, just having met a murder victim means that you're implicated in their death? Well, that's what Jack's worried about, so presumably it, it would well, he, soil but, both of but their But he had a physical relationship with him. The, this, this person just picked her up hitch hitchhiking and dropped her off and never gave her a second thought. Yeah, but... He could pretend that more than that happened. Mm. You know, it's one man's word against the others. Yeah. <laughs> one man, Jack Amsterdam versus a priest? Yeah. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, you also have Campion, though. He He's outnumbered. Tom spots Amsterdam kneeling on his way out of the church and enters the opposite side of the confessional, like the shoulder angel of Monsignor's conscience. What are you doing giving absolution to that McPimp? He also gives Des a heads up that they're bringing Jack in for killing Lois. It's very important to Des that the charges are false because he couldn't live with himself if all this time he was aligned with a brutal murderer. Did he do it, Tommy? Highest honors bestowed on that. Tommy, did he do it? I don't care whether they killed her. I don't give a shit. I just don't care. I do. <laughs> I mean, I, he clearly he didn't. He already knows that he didn't. The yeah, the, right, but he cares. When he says, I don't care if he did it, what he means is, I don't care that he didn't do it. Yeah, but but... It, at this point in the movie, I was like, well, who did do it? Did the filmmaker. Did, we don't know that for certain, though. Her blood was all over the movie set. D but th th that's still not proof of anything. Circumstantial. Yeah. I, I think it's as close as we get to uh, 
a clear murderer. See, to me, like you could use that letter for that Jack signs. She'll stay out of your hair because I killed her. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Check your bathtub. She'll stay out of your hair. Yeah, I, I was like, th- this whole thing is very frustrating. This movie. Yeah. Tom admits that it's worth taking Jack down, even if Des goes with him, and Des agrees. We cut to probably months later as Des exits the courthouse surrounded by a mob of reporters asking if he'll still work in the local church, but of course he will. He's a Monsignor. He has no other life skills, and the church has spent millennia building a system to protect abusers by just rotating them around to new churches. He'll be fine. So, what crimes has Jack committed? Uh, uh, he ran girls, we ran, know, at least. Okay. Yeah, he operated that whorehouse. All right, so that, that that's the crime that Tom is so desperate to pin him for? Well, I th- I think Tom's point is not to uh, prove that he's the murderer, really. What he wants is for Jack to have to go to court and say, no, I was just fucking this prostitute. Okay. Even though he has a wife and family and he is the Christian layman of the year. Right. He just wants to drag his drag him through the mud. Right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, and that's worth his also destroying his brother's career. Yes. Just dragging because, this guy through the because mud. Because he's told his brother over and over again not to work with this guy. Mm. And it looked like he was still going to go through with this school. We dissolve back to the desert church where we started the film with the two old brothers. Their old person makeup isn't bad, but neither one has enough wrinkles and Duvall has way too much hair. And this, both these, I hate this button. I hate these buttons. Yeah, it's not I, necessary really. The, this, the opening and closing of this film did nothing for me. In the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think it serves a purpose, the, the book ending stuff. Des claims he's prepared for his impending death and Tom promises to sing at his funeral. Outside, they visit the grave of Seamus Fargo, and we learn that the Monsignors reunited here, and Des was taught to forgive himself. Tom apologizes for what he's put his brother through. It's my fault, Des, all of it. Every bit of it. I'm sorry. Well, Tommy, you were my salvation, actually. You made me remember things that I had forgotten, and I thought I was someone who I wasn't. Des shows Tom the plot he's picked out at the edge of the small churchyard cemetery, and we slowly fade to black on the brothers looking down at the gravesite. I get the implication here that they haven't spoken to each other since this, since this whole thing. Oh, I out. didn't get that impression. Okay, that, that, that's how I felt like. It's like they haven't seen each other because he doesn't know anything about this church or who, like, like he's meeting the the other priest there. Yeah, for the that first does time. seem like yeah. Like I I haven't seen him in so long. I guess that, it's possible. Yeah. That, that they've been apart this entire time. Um, and was there a line? Like, I wasn't clear. I kept listening to it over again. Uh, that it sounded like he was hoping that his brother, that Tom would also go to rest here, like when it's his time. That's what I thought too. And I, I, I listened for it the second time and I mm. couldn't tell if that's what he was implying. Yeah. But I think he... Because he sounds so disgusted by the idea of being buried here in the dirt that it seems like he's talking about his own resting place. Right. You know? And neither one of them seems to have, like, a family or anything, so it would make sense for them to both be buried here. Because I assume their mom is dead by this point and buried yeah. somewhere. It's possible. So that was True Confessions. Very unsatisfying movie. I do think it's strange to take the story of the Black Dahlia killing, which didn't have, like, a canonical feature film adaptation... And to write it to be a story about a corrupt church construction yeah. business. Mm-hmm. I don't, I it's don't a, get it. It's a weird choice. I don't think it's bad. I, th- I think uh, there's there's not enough like emotion in the performances from anybody for this to have been an awards movie, though. Yeah. Especially De Niro. Yeah. I, th- I think it's, it's a weird choice for both of them to uh, c- connect themselves to. I really didn't care for anything in this movie. Like, it was confusing, boring. What I like about it is any movie that takes place in the 40s and deals with detectives and yeah, these old cars and yeah. stuff like that. I like seeing that stuff. I agree. I love the that aesthetic. stuff. Yeah. And I still didn't like this movie. Yeah. And, and, and when I also, like, what when watching it, it's like, oh, Robert De is a corrupt preacher. It's like, oh, no, great. But not really. Well, he he's I, I mean I guess not not really corrupt, 
but he's willing to make deals with corrupt people yeah. Yeah. in order to in order he's to save He's selling the money. soul of the church. Yeah. Sure. And so I was like, okay, so I don't like this guy. So and then in comes Tom Spellacy. He's like, okay, he's a he's a detective. And then he slaps that woman. I was like, oh, so there are just no right. people that but I like. This in is this also movie. in 1980. It was it was like funny to slap women. But I, f- I feel like literally that's the only character breaking moment for him because otherwise the point is that it's like my brother is a monsignor at a church mm-hmm. and I'm a detective for the LAPD and I'm the good one. Yeah. Because for the most part he's doing the right thing in the rest of the story. Right. And he's yeah. the one with the with the moral certitude to be like we need to bring this Jack guy down even if it hurts us. I, I think the concepts for me uh is that the murder the murder seems unsolved like i know you were saying like it's like oh well the 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 filmmaker did it but we get nothing of that there's no there's no like there's no like press conference or anything like that like that shows like yeah this case has been solved but i mean we saw a detective find the crime scene i feel like that's that's enough to set in motion the idea that there was there was enough evidence here. Her purse was on the table. They know it's her blood. But it There's... was so unimportant. The fact that he found this at the end, it almost didn't even matter that he figured this out. I mean, it matters but... to some people. It doesn't matter to the church story, really. Yeah, I don't know. It... Except that it implicates Jack in having handed her off to this pornographer. Some and Weirdly structured movie. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like this may have worked better with... Uh, having more stuff i I, because i know the black dahlia murder was just the one right you know it 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 seemed like this this was like a better backdrop would have been to have like a serial set of murders like there's more going on and it can continue to be something in the background but it's never about what the movie's about yeah we spend so much time on the murder that is like is this movie about the murder is this about the brothers or is this about jack amsterdam we never spent enough time with any of those stories well that's the other thing because the story does have so many confusing elements i kept consulting the wikipedia page and if you read the wikipedia page you would have no idea that robert de niro's character is important to the plot the way the plot is summarized there every paragraph starts with detective tom spellacy goes and gets this information detective tom spellacy goes and gets this information and all the stuff that happens with the church characters is like while equally important to what the story of the film is 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 not interesting Mm -hmm. so you're just like who cares about Seamus I don't care that he went away I don't care that he's going to be a bishop I don't care that they made a deal with this guy like none of it really matters to the audience except for the murder case right so it just seems like it was supposed to be a two-hander and there's a brother that you care about and a brother that you don't care about the whole time yeah and and the fact that they were brothers it didn't to me it didn't really play up they could just as easily have been childhood friends or something yeah like exactly that. like i i was trying to think like would this movie had been more interesting if they were still brothers but they never outright said it till closer to the end yeah like you know you would just assume like oh they're friends but everyone's hinting that there's a bigger relationship between the two of them and then there's like the reveal like i don't care if this brings you down too like yeah. because like then the, the big reveal would be like oh that they that they're that they're related that they're more than just friends right but I was trying to think of I was trying to think of ways to make the movie more interesting yeah <laughs> it's I, hard. I don't think that would have helped <laughs> I I, I, was, I think that would have just been like are they lovers what is happening <laughs> which would have also been more interesting <laughs> I I did like the line uh. <laughs> like when he's with the altar boys it's like you put too much wine it's like oh yeah it's like it's like i don't need a, a pick me up stiff uh <laughs> a stiff drink in the morning or something because i guess he has to drink the whole thing yeah because like, like, he can't just put it back in the bottle <laughs> you only drink half my jesus today <laughs> yeah i got a whole jesus foot in my stomach because it's supposed to turn back into him right I guess the blood is is yeah. or the wine is blood. And wine that. is blood. Yeah. yeah. Was someone there was like a some post about like Jesus never used pronouns. It's like I think he identified as bread at one point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as far as thumbs up, thumbs down for this, it's it's a thumbs down for me. Yeah, for sure, thumbs down. It's okay. <laughs> I, yeah, you can... for everyone to say thumbs down. It's okay. <laughs> so your implication there is that it's not okay 
for one of us to say thumbs up. Do you honestly think this is a thumbs up? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better Black Dahlia movie than Brian De Palma made, though. I'll say that. Oh, boy. That's rough, then. That, that, it's that, really bad. I it? could not believe how bad it was. Is, that, is Adrian Brody in that? No. Who's, who's, the, guy, who's the leads in that? <sighs> <laughs> I don't yeah, remember. Yes, it has, it. Aaron Eckhart is a detective. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think uh, what's his name from uh, Forty Days and Forty Nights? Steve Carell. Wait, no, no, that's Forty Year Old Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josh Hartnett. There you go. He's he's a detective or some shit. I don't know. It's bad. And Scarlett Johansson's in there, and she's trying to do the Mid Atlantic thing, but she's uh, not pulling it off. You, you need Jennifer Jason Lee in there for that. Yeah, it's uh, and it's got. Every scene starts with voiceover Ugh. of Hartnett doing the voiceover as a detective character. And it's uh, like, no, I don't need this. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop talking. Only in Sin City will I allow that. Yeah. But this movie feels like, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that it was a response to Chinatown. And they mm. were like, that was fun. Let's do a movie like that where there's like a mystery unfolding. But it's so discombobulated and confusing that it's like it feels like you try to stay really strictly to the book and i don't care for it um so yeah i'll say thumbs down then uh where's this going letterboxd Ooh. richard you go first on this one well i don't have it that low so i, I have it pretty much right in the middle i have it uh at 60 uh what's puts it below night school but above prince of the city because okay. i felt I felt just as bewildered by Prince of the City. Prince of the City is much worse, I think. But this also has a better cast than that movie does. I have it pretty low. I have it at 94. Okay. Uh, it's just above Mommy Dearest and below SOB. I have it at 91 out of 131 right now, um, which is just under Winter of Our Dreams and just above Southern Comfort. Our director here was Ulu Grossbard. He previously directed Who is Harry Kellerman and Why Is He Saying Those Terrible Things About Me? and Straight Time. We'll see his work next time for Falling in Love, starring De Niro and Streep, presumably a prequel to Falling in Love Again from last season. He also has a special thanks credit in Reservoir Dogs. I don't know what that's about. The writer here was John Gregory Dunn. He wrote the novel and a draft of the screenplay. With his wife, novelist Joan Didion, he had previously written Panic in Needle Park, Play It As It Lays, and A Star Is Born, for which they both take a credit on the 2018 remake. John was the brother of investigative journalist Dominic Dunn, who is in turn the father of Dominique and Griffin Dunn. We saw Griffin in The Fan and American Werewolf in London earlier this season, and Dominique shows up in Poltergeist next season, but was tragically strangled by her ex-boyfriend just after the film's release. Writer Gary S. Hall was uncredited for some work he did on the screenplay. He later produced a handful of 21 Jump Streets. The music here was from George Delarue, who also scored Rich and Famous later this season, and later Silkwood, Salvador, Platoon, Biloxi Blues, Twins, Beaches, Joe vs. the Volcano, Black Robe, and Curly Sue, among others. He also has an Oscar for his score to 1979's A Little Romance. This was Delarue's first score recorded in the U.S., Originally, Bill Conti was announced as the film's composer, but shooting delays forced him to leave early to score For Your Eyes Only. Cinematographer Owen Roisman was the DP on The French Connection, The Exorcist, Taking of Pelham 123, Stepford Wives Network, and so far on the show Black Marble, which is beautiful, as are all those other films. He's back later this season for Absence of Malice and Taps, and he later lights Tootsie, The Addams Family, Wyatt Earp, and French Kiss. Editor Lindsay Klingman cut One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Hair, and later cuts A River Runs Through It, Hoffa, Outbreak, Man on the Moon, and The Beaver. Robert De Niro played Des Spellacy. This was his first film after the Raging Bull Oscar, and like I said, he only had a couple weeks to lose all the weight he'd gained for that. He's in Cape Fear, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, Goodfellas, Casino, The Irishman for for Martin Scorsese. All those movies were Martin Scorsese. Uh, he's also in The Godfather, Deer Hunter, Brazil, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Jackie Brown, and Meet the Parents. Robert Duvall played Detective Sergeant Tom Spellacy. Amazingly, this is the first time we've seen him since the month we started the podcast, where he showed up as Frank Burns in MASH. He's also in THX 1138, 
The Godfather, The Conversation, Godfather Part 2, Apocalypse Now, The Great Santini, for which he was nominated against Brother De Niro's Jake LaMotta last year. We'll see him next in Pursuit of D.B. Cooper later this season. And even later, he's in The Natural, Newsies, Phenomenon, Deep Impact, Gone in 60 Seconds, Get Low, and The Judge. Director Grossbard had worked with Duvall on stage in the past for productions of A View from the Bridge and American Buffalo. Charles Durning played Jack Amsterdam. Before this, he was in The Sting, Dog Day Afternoon, and The Hindenburg. We've seen him so far in The Fury, Die Laughing, and The Final Countdown. And Jess usually brings up Doc Hopper from the Muppet movie. Of course I do. Kenneth McMillan played Detective Frank Crotty. Before this, he was in Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. We've seen him in Little Miss Marker, Hide in Plain Sight, Carney, Borderline, and Eyewitness. He's back later this season for Ragtime, Whose Life Is It Anyway, and Heartbeeps. Later, he's Baron Vladimir Harkonnen in Lynch's Dune and Captain Clarence O'Connell in Armed and Dangerous. Ed Flanders played Dan T. Campion. He's President Truman in MacArthur, Colonel Richard Fell in The Ninth Configuration, and he's back as Truman next season, voice only, for Inchon, and later this season in The Pursuit of D.B. Cooper. He comes back for Exorcist Three as Father Dyer. Cyril Cusack played Cardinal Danaher. He was Captain Beatty in Fahrenheit 451 and Charrington in 1984. Two movies that get discussed a lot lately, Fahrenheit 451 and 1984. Mm -hmm. Burgess Meredith played Monsignor Seamus Fargo. He's Mickey in the Rocky films. He's Penguin on the 60s Batman. We've seen him so far in When Time Ran Out, Clash of the Titans, and Burnt Offerings. He also narrates the Twilight Zone movie. He also got Oscar nominations for Rocky and Day of the Locust. And, of course, he's in some classic Twilight Zone yeah. episodes. Rose Gregorio played Brenda Samuels. She was the wife at the time of director Ulu Grossbard. Before this, she appeared in his film The Deep End of the Ocean. And after this, she shows up in his film Who is Harry Kellerman and Why is He Saying Those Terrible Things About Me? Dan Hedaya played Howard Turkle. I wish he'd been in more of this. Yeah. He's Julian Marty in Blood Simple. He's the dad in Clueless. He's also the dad in Night at the Roxbury, the father of Stephen Doug Butabi. We saw him last as Sergeant Otis Barnes, the shotgun-wielding maniac cop in Night of the Juggler. I was going to say, like uh, you had mentioned, uh, I think it was, was it the editor? Or maybe the music who did Joe versus the Volcano? Yes. Because yeah, like, he's... Because he's Dan Hedaya is in a lot of stuff. Yep. Um, but uh, he's the boss in, in the basement office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gwen Van Dam played Mrs. Fazenda. We've seen her so far as the waitress at Frankie's in Secondhand Hearts and Mrs. Beatty in Stir Crazy. Thomas Hill played Mr. Fazenda. He was Bobby Mimosa in Hide in Plain Sight and the president in the Nude Bomb last season. He's also Barlow in The Postman Always Rings twice earlier this season. He's better known to me for his part as Carl Conrad Coriander in The NeverEnding Story, which I think is the guy that Bastion steals the book from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeanette Nolan played Mrs. Spellacy, the mother in the rest home. We heard her earlier this season as Widow Tweed in The Fox and the Hound. She also voices Elle May in The Rescuers. She plays Bertha Duncan in The Big Heat. Nora Erickson in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, but most importantly, she played the token magical homeless person, Carol, in MacGyver's Season 5 Christmas episode. Uh, she's often, almost always, with her husband. Yeah, who doesn't uh, show up in this Yeah, one. I was like, I was look, I was searching for him in the cast. I was like, he's yeah. not in here. But he was in Fox and the Hound, yeah, he and was they were in both in Rescuers together. Yep, and Cloak and Dagger, yeah. and Goliath Awaits. Louisa Moritz played Horror. She was Myra in Death Race 2000 and Rose in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. We've seen her so far in Loose Shoes, New Year's Evil, and Under the Rainbow. I think she was the, um, she's the one in this film who says, you sit on my face and I'll guess your weight. Mm. But she was the woman who was answering the phones at the hotel and then leaves with the manager okay. mm. at the beginning of that film. Matthew Faison played reporter number two. He was Stan in Friday the 13th, six, and Springwood teacher in Freddy's Dead. Richard Ferrangi played the ambulance driver who didn't want to use two stretchers. We just had him as Joe Marinero in Prince of the City, and later he shows up in Midnight Run and Ghostbusters 2. James Hong was Coroner Wong. We just had him a couple episodes back in So Fine. He's Lo Pan in Big Trouble in Little China, Mr. Ping in the Kung Fu Panda films, Hannibal Chu in Blade Runner, Cassandra's dad in Wayne's World 2, Evelyn Mulray's butler in Chinatown, He's in a couple of great MacGyvers, and we've seen him so far in Airplane as the passenger who kills himself to escape Stryker's boring stories. Louis Basile played Detective Number 3. He was Vince Rizzo in The Formula and a cab driver in Little Miss Marker. 
Louise Lewis played Older Nun. She was Principal Ferguson in I Was a Teenage Werewolf. Do you guys recall the last time we mentioned I Was a Teenage Werewolf? No. We watched a scene from it in an earlier movie. Fade to Black? No. Uh... Summer Camp put it on on Parents' Day. And then s- someone spliced nudity into the film. Was it Gorp? Gorp. That's correct. Missy Cleveland played Lois Fazenda, the murder victim. She's credited as Amanda Cleveland. She was the co-ed lover in Blowout and a massage girl in Cheech and Chong's next movie. Sig Froelich played Waiter. He was Shark Man in a 1936 Flash Gordon. Winged Monkey in The Famous Wizard of Oz. Last season, he was Plane Maintenance Man in Airplane. And earlier this season, he was a custodian in First Monday in October. Possibly the one that found the spittoon behind the bench and was like, does she need this? Stephen Powers played a photographer. He was Sergeant Christian in The Ninth Configuration and Radar Man in The Swarm. I think that's everything for True Confessions. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Letterboxd. Whereas I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord. You can join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future at VintageVideoPodcast.com slash Discord. And if you're listening on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing episode 300. 300 episodes. Chariots of Fire, which IMDb describes like so. Two British track athletes, one a determined Jew and the other a devout Christian, are driven to win in the 1924 Olympics as they wrestle with issues of pride and conscience. We leave you now with a trailer for Chariots of Fire. Bam, 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 probably. This is a story of two men who run. Not to run, but to prove something to the world. They will sacrifice anything to achieve their goals, except their honor. received unanimous critical acclaim. Majestic, masterful, triumphant, and joyful, says the Los Angeles Times. The New York Times calls it rousing and invigorating. ABC TV says you'll be riveted, enthralled, and you'll cheer like crazy. It's for everyone, says Newsweek. And the New York Daily News promises it will lift your spirits to a new high. Chariots of Fire.